Welcome to Negronis with Nord, episode 86. Today, I am so excited to talk to Nikki Reardon, whose TikToks have been passed around our company's Slack channel for years now. He started his career building out the social strategy at BuzzFeed, eventually racking up hundreds of millions of views there, and now is a full-time content creator. We talk about the Harris campaign and whether they are off to a good or bad start. We talk a decent amount about Charlie XCX, as that is one of his great passions, authenticity and what brands get wrong when they are briefing creators. Nikki has this way of branding and capturing what is working on social and putting it into snackable, actionable advice. I loved this conversation and excited for y'all to hear it. Nikki Reardon, thank you for joining us. Before we jump in, and I wanna to get to like the meat of the conversation as quickly as we can, but I wanna give some context to everyone who is listening to this or watching it. Um, give us a, a little quick TLDR on your career, how you got here, what you do, who you are. So I um, have been pretty much working in entertainment uh, creator stuff all my life. I was very chronic, a very chronically online teenager, which is my origin story for sure. Ran a stand Twitter account, all that fun stuff. And then out of college, my first job was at BuzzFeed. So I used to be a social strategist there. And this was like right when TikTok was really um, starting to pick up in the US, like right after they had made this shift from Musical.ly. And I think they were just like, we need like a Gen Z kid who just like really understands what this platform is. So I think I was like their third or fourth hire for like just TikTok ever which was awesome. It was great. I had so much creative freedom. Um, and I was pretty much always in entertainment stuff. So like always doing music, movies, that type of stuff. I mean, BuzzFeed did everything. There's food and travel and blah, blah, blah. So that's what I did for, for my first years. I, it was like my beginning of like running a brand account and growing it to a million followers, you know, and like, what was that like? And building out a short form video strategy for a company that made entirely long form content at the time, which was really, really cool and interesting. And then after that, I think I had just kind of like, to fill, I don't know, I was very fixated on like that benchmark and was just like ready to do something else. Um, so that's when I moved into more of like the brand partnership side. Um, so I did campaigns, we pitched campaigns for from Procter and Gamble to HBO Max to Amazon, like you name it, Sephora. We've they probably executed something at some point. Um, and that was also after that, uh, Buzzfeed had a pirate complex at this time. So this was, um, before a, a lot of the unfortunate demise that that has happened in recent years. But it was, I mean, at the time it was cool. It, it was such an incredible, I think, like gateway into this world for me. And, you know, halfway through, or, or, while I was there, I had a really incredible mentor. And one of the best pieces of advice they ever gave me was, you can get 10 million views on the video you're editing today. But at the end of the day, anything you do for this company is owned by this company. And if mm -hmm. you quit tomorrow or you get laid off tomorrow, um, they will replace you within a week. So whatever you're doing, like think of think of like how you want to build something for yourself creatively, whatever that thing is, whether it's just building a network of people, whether it's uh, starting a sub stack, whether it's like what, there's so many different ways to create now, but like you should not only put all your eggs in one basket, like really look at this as like a skill set to hone and craft here and think about how you do that on your own. Um, so that was when I started making TikTok videos and um, I had been working with creators. I had a whole roster of creators um, that I was like tasked with working with. Um, and I had just been doing strategy for them for so long that I was like, well, I, you know, if you want to hire a basketball coach, or, like, you should probably hire somebody who's played basketball before. So like, I was like, okay, like I got to learn how to play basketball. You know what I mean? Um, so that was literally how I got into it. And then a year after that, I quit my job and I do this full time now. Um, and now I also like do a bunch of consulting on the side for a bunch of different brands and agencies, music labels, all that fun stuff. So yeah, that's kind of just how I, I like stumbled into this almost weirdly. It was like a perfect preparing me like two years in social strategy, then like two yeah. years in like brand partnerships. And now I just, that's what I do all the time. You know what I mean? But just for myself instead of a company. So. You know, your name has been kicked around the walls of four um, for some time now. And we have we have this Slack channel that's just industry news and, and, and you know, we share articles or interesting pieces of content. And I feel like I first became aware of what you were doing because you people kept dropping your TikToks into the industry news channel. And it felt like you were doing a really good job branding and condensing some of the ideas we were talking about into these like snackable little insights. 
you know, helped us maybe have the language to explain this, you know, more easily. But certainly I think it's something that is so important for clients, especially, you know, a lot of times we have a, a younger client who understands the space, but they have to tell someone more senior, why is this important? What is, you know, why should you care about like Brat Summer or whatever the hell it is? But I think you do a, such a nice job. And if you all don't follow him, you absolutely should. But like um, condensing this stuff into stuff that, that, you know, yeah, you're almost like putting a tagline on underlying currents of what is like moving social. So let's talk a little bit about that. And we can use an example um, one of the ones that I know people loved uh, at four was the the you before I effect. And maybe that's a good one to like to explain to everyone here what I'm talking about of what you do such a good job of like taking a bigger theme and giving it a name and making it really understandable. So talk to us about that. Sure. Yeah, I'll quickly like summarize like what the you before I effect is and then I'll like give the story of like how it how it came to be. So what it is in short essentially is like talking about like the way a for you page operates or the way any sort of you know short form algorithm operates is i would say you are not the main character the audience is like if the way these things work now is like the majority of viewership comes from people who do not follow you have no idea who you are you are a stranger on the internet they do not care about what you're saying they don't care like they are not interested right it is like the same way if you know, like I always say people are like, what I, what I eat in a day or something. Like imagine if you were at a bar, like a crowded bar or something, and some random stranger came up to you and they're like, this is what I had for lunch. <laughs> you'd be like, cool, dude. Like, thanks, man. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's your, it's not that I yeah. don't like you. It's just like, you are a stranger. That is That information is completely useless to me. Um, mm -hmm. So really like under trying to understand of like, you aren't the main character of the audience is. People are inherently self-interested. We all care about things that apply to us um, and we wanna know how things impact us. So when I say the you before I effect, it's as simple as like, just even sometimes using the word you instead of I, you know? So like, for example, um, literally like the video you're talking about, like a, a series that I do is like, this is how you go from zero to your first 100,000 followers as a blank creator. And that's such an easy example of like, it's not how I did it. I could say how right, I did right. it, but it's how you do it, right? I'm giving you, hey, this is start point, end point, right? Zero to 100K. This is for you. If you want this piece of information, if you want this desired outcome, watch the video. And then the remaining three minutes of it is just my opinion. It's just me talking mm -hmm. about, but it's as simple as even just like phrasing it of like, you before me, because the person who's seeing this needs to understand how this is going to apply to them um, before they even care who I am or what I have to say. And yep. you can do that with literally anything. Like another example I always um, like love to use or like, you know, it's like use like makeup for an example, you know, like you can be like, okay, like I'm putting on my morning routine, whatever. If I don't know who you are, I do not care. I don't care what foundation <laughs> you're wearing. I don't, if I don't know you, you're a stranger, right? But if you're like, if you struggle with acne prone skin like I do, you know how frustrating it can be to deal with breakouts. Mm -hmm. Like even just by simply like, hey, let me set the stage of this problem. Let me set the stage of, you know, if you experience this thing, I also experience that. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to build the solution with you. Like that is so enticing to a viewer. And I think truly like so much of like, you know, brands or, or people are really trying to think like there's so much of this like word community, you know, and buzzword mm -hmm. and Community is so important, but you don't build community unless you can appeal to somebody who doesn't know who you are yet. Um, and that yeah. I think is really like an important thing with like this you before I effect is just thinking about how does this, why would a stranger care? And if you can't answer that question, then you need to shift the video to answer that question. I mean, there's so much I want to like uh, talk about from that. And I think like something we've always told influencers is, is you know, that you, you you need to operate in service of your audience, right? And like, it's such an interesting, as a creator, it's such an interesting like job because, um, and I think something where like, where influencers can kind of go off the rails a little bit is forgetting that their entire life is a product of their ability to like, uh, get people to watch the shit that they're doing, but that like their audience makes their life possible and that they should be waking up every day being like, how can I make something that this audience is going to like? How can I give them something that they like is going to make their lives better instead of like, I've now got this great life. Let me like show off about it and like, uh, and flex a little bit, which is very self-serving and not maybe super interesting, but it's interesting. I'm much older than you. Um, 
I started this business in 2012. I've been putting shit on the internet since 2006. There was an interesting shift. Early internet was very like, look at what I made. You know, it was about, are you a photographer? Are you an artist? Or, you know, do you know a lot about cars or politics or whatever, right? This is what I made. Old school Tumblr days, uh, when Tumblr was really small and that was like my first platform. Like on Wednesdays, there was like this, uh, it was called GPOYW, which is gratuitous picture of yourself Wednesday. But like there literally had to be a like, a like kind of playful th- like bucket to get people to share a photo of themselves because it was so weird that you would post a photo of yourself on the internet, which is like, I, I think for people who came to the internet later, uh, that is like obviously the core of the entire internet. But, but we shifted to this like, from look what I made to look at me and now we're in a new, I feel like what you're saying is like, we're maybe in a little bit of a new phase, right? It's not so much just look at me. It's not really like, look at my art. What do you think the like essence of it is like? I think it is really, I mean, two things. I think one, I hate to say this word because people I think overuse it so much that it bothers me, like relatability, you know, like it's, it's become such an industry word that I feel like it's almost lost its meaning a little bit. Ironically, um, But almost like another word that I think even describes it better is like companionship. Like, I really think that it's not just let me do this. It's like, let's do it together. It's such a real thing. Even when I just think about content all the time, like I love to watch YouTube, big, big fan of YouTube. Every night when I sit down for dinner, I turn on YouTube. And that's like an example of like the YouTuber is a companion for me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's, I'm not eating dinner alone anymore. I'm I'm being entertained in some way. Or, I mean, we see this rise of podcasting now, right? Even what we're doing right now, like I guarantee there's a listener at the gym, you know what I mean? Or a listener on a drive to work. And that's this form of companionship, right? They don't, they are, are doing this thing alone, but are able to now access this concept of of humanity in some way through the internet and that's like what i always say like humans crave humanity you know like we love people we love to be with people it's in our nature and i really think that like this concept of companionship or even like things like just talking about things that people are like man i wish i could talk with my friend about that you know like going off recent memory for me like i just i did a recent podcast episode literally just like this entire review of brat like the album i'm talking about mm-hmm. um musically but also um talking about like the marketing behind that album and like why i think it was like truly like a rollout to be studied, you know what I mean? In the way it has like transcended media mediums, even like it's literally having mm-hmm. influence over politics right now. It's right. like insane. And that was just so fascinating to me. And so much of the comments are just people are like, oh my God, like I wish, like I was just talking to my friend about this, or I wish I could talk to so and so about like it's just people who are like, I want to have this conversation and I don't have somebody to have this conversation with right now. And even though I'm not there with you, I get the feeling that we are discussing similar ideas. You know what I mean? Like anything like that, mm-hmm. I think it's just like I, another like Nikki quote I always like to say is like building the bridge of common interest. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. there is you and there's this stranger on the internet, but there's something you're both interested in. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And even if they don't know who you are, the way you get build the bridge to get them onto the side of who you are is this common interest. So that could be brat for one person. That could be um, the you, somebody who's like works in influencer marketing is really interested in the you before I effect for somebody else. And mm-hmm. For another one of my followers might be me reviewing a movie. You know what I mean? There's no one size fits all solution, but that is the way like they, you grow this community of people is by like finding these bridges of common interest and to whatever way that is. That's really interesting. Um, I love the, the let's do that together and companionship. And I think it also tracks, uh, I think even more so for your generation and, and, and Gen Z, I mean, there's so much of life is defined by being isolated. COVID and missing out on things like, you know, so many people missed out on the last years of their college or or high school or whatever it might be. And, you know, as people live their lives increasingly on the internet and they feel more isolated. And Instagram, it, I feel like was increasingly and, and still is dominated by people are maybe a little bit older. It is more like, I'm gonna keep you a bit out of my life but look how great my life is. And like, you can aspire to it, but like, you don't have a seat at the table. And again, I've been in this industry long enough to see the cycles and like everybody, relatability, authenticity, people loved influencers because they were these people living similar lives to them. And then those people started making half a million, $700,000, million dollars a year. And, you know, and talking about, you know, how to get 
the Birkin that you want. And, and then their lives got so ridiculous, they had to stop sharing. It's so unrelatable. And, and you talk about relatability being really interesting companionship. But what about when your companions become millionaires or how do people, you know, artists, famous, like how do people navigate that? And how do you think relatability plays into the capitalist nature of these platforms? That's a great question. I mean, I think, I can think of like two examples that I think are interesting. One person, uh, I'll do like the first example of somebody who I think is currently struggling with the problem you're describing and somebody who's like in the midst of going through it. Um, like someone who I think really struggled with that and continues to struggle with it is Emma Chamberlain, for example, where she, I think, really came up as this like golden child of YouTube really relatable, right? Like doing st stupid things like farting on camera and was getting coffee in her car on the way to high school. And now she's hosting the Met Gala and she's yeah. doing a, a architectural digest tour with her right. $6 million Los Angeles home, right? It is exactly what you're describing where um, she is not relatable anymore. She's aspirational. Um, she has become almost like this celebrity level, mm -hmm. which I think is interesting. One, I think it's, I think perhaps there is this section of it that is this opportunity cost, right? Like at some point the audience changes as you change, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and that maybe one, that there's not necessarily anything wrong with that, but that's a byproduct of it, right? If, if you get mm -hmm. to a certain level, um, that will happen. And then I think the other half of it too is like somebody who's like really good at it and doing it we're seeing right now is like a, a chapel room. Like this is like such like a zero to 100 story. But the reason I think people have really like rallied around her and are like excited about it is because she's like really like documented the journey. And like people like, I think people are, are like, like seeing people win if they understand the effort that went through to get there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it's, if somebody, you know, or even me, if I randomly came out tomorrow and said, I'm hosting the Grammys, that might make me not so relatable anymore. You know what I mean? But right. if I made 50 videos about like, I, it is my dream to host the Grammys. It's all I ever wanted to do. I will do anything in my power. I'm gonna make videos about this. And blah. You know what I mean? Like that's so interesting. Like that, it's like your, the narrative I think is really interesting and cool. Or, um, another creator actually, I think does it well. Is like, are you familiar with like a guy with a movie camera? His name's Reese. He was a TikToker. He started in like early 2020. TikToker, he started as a production assistant. So literally like, first initially blew up because he was like on the sets of movies and was like recording this stuff probably mm. illegally <laughs> but um the video started doing really, really well so then i'm sure they liked yeah. it and enjoyed the free press yeah. for the movie and now like if you look at his content it is only, pretty much only interviewing celebrities like only actors yep. and movie stars and blah 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 but nobody ever i've ever heard any criticism of him and for mm. that and i think it's because he built the narrative he built the journey you know it didn't just start at chapter 10 it started at zero like it, you saw yep. him as a underpaid production assistant so four yep. years later it doesn't seem out of touch it seems celebrated and people are like mm -hmm. whoa it's so cool that this person that i was supporting four years ago is like reaching these levels that other people have never seen so i think maybe it's that i think it's like crafting mm -hmm. a narrative talking about like being relatable is like it's aspiring for something and putting effort and work in to achieve some sort of desired outcome is relatable to everybody you know like yeah. it, what their what your desired outcome is might change but the act of of working hard or whatever is something that people can resonate with so i yeah. think maybe it's that i don't know yeah and emma's such a good example because i i remember we uh we did something a video about her or we talked about it and you can see like if you look at year by year, it's like she did 200 YouTube videos and then she did like 70 and then she did, you know, go and now she does like one a year, maybe even the like platforms change. And I think what's what's an interesting point there. And I know you talk about niches as well. Emma got a following because she just like documented her life and people could look at and be like, oh, I too go to high school and you're funny and you are creative and all these things. Now all of a sudden your life is so different. It's like the fashion influencers who got a following because they could like pull together an old Navy outfit that looked really great. And then they started wearing Chanel and it's like, wait, <laughs> this isn't what I came here for. You know, I came here for like, how do I style Zara clothing and make it look good? And now you are wearing $30,000 outfits every day and like getting gifted by brands that I couldn't dream of even affording and I no longer think this is interesting. 
Something that we have been thinking a lot about, and, and this goes to your kind of first point, is authenticity has been like the word in, in influencer marketing for so long. I almost hate it now. <laughs> yeah, but I think to what you're saying, you know, the fact that most people who see your content don't know who you are. What's interesting there is that authenticity is rooted in like a relationship. You might follow me and you know who I am and you know my lifestyle. And then I could come and be like, you know what I love? I love the clothes at Walmart for men. They're so amazing. And I could do this whole video about it and you could look at that and be like, you're fucking bullshitting. Like I know that you would never shop at Walmart. I know you're lying um, because you have a relationship with me, right? Um, but as increasingly the people who see your content don't have a relationship, it's interesting because like authenticity doesn't really matter, right? It's believability. It's relatability to, to your point, right? Like you have to get a person who has no idea who you are to believe what you're saying without a pre-existing relationship. What do you think that does to this space if honestly like telling the truth maybe isn't as important, but getting people to believe you becomes really important? I think it's a mix of both of the things that you're describing. Like I think one, I, I like I always say, to any like client I've ever worked with, like whenever they bring up the word authenticity, I'm like, the second you're trying to plan how to be authentic, you are not being authentic. Like you lost, like you're, mm -hmm. you're defeated. I was like, what are we talking about? Like, what do you mean? Or, you know, or can you do this in a more authentic way? Is like something I've heard of brand deals. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I, this is what I, like what, how I turned the camera on and spoke is me. Like the way you might, mm -hmm. you might perceive it as differently than that, but like, this is me, you know what I mean? So there's that to it. I mean, again, talking about like appealing to these people you don't know, like using my own content as an example is like, what I'm talking about is whether if the internet died tomorrow, whether we shut this podcast interview down, like I will listen to Brat the album. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. as it's just an example, like it's just, it is who I am. It's in my nature. I've been listening to pop music since I was a teenager. Like um, I've been interested in the internet culture since I was a teenager. Like that's just, it is my interest. Um, it's what I talk about with my friends when we go to dinner. Mm -hmm. It is why, and the people I'm friends with like to talk about that stuff too. You know what I mean? Even though it's it, like in times, especially, you know, using for an example, like something that's like a podcast and I'm like cutting and clipping it down. It's not necessarily like a fully scripted planned hook, but I do think that there is this element of like, this is what I talk about. And um, yeah. people like that almost. It's kind of, people sometimes even like just feeling like a fly on the wall. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. interesting to, again, like humans crave humanity. We like to talk to people, we like to listen to people. Mm -hmm. um, and if somebody's talking about something that you love and you're interested in, then sometimes they'll just be interested si simply because of that. And I think too, that just like on camera, passion really comes through. Like you can tell mm -hmm. when people are, and there's even times I've tried, like I have felt it, you know what I mean? Like there's not like, I, not, I don't like every movie. I don't like every, I don't like every album. I don't like every brand. I don't like every campaign. And sometimes I'm like, you get caught in that, in the pressure of like, you see six other people getting so many views talking about this thing. Mm -hmm. But when I try to talk about it, I just don't care. <laughs> so the video mm -hmm. doesn't come out that well. And the audience yeah. knows, like, I feel like it's whether they directly know that or whether just the quality of the video is not the same, it it impacts performance in some way. Whereas, you know, if I, I've talked about things like literally, literally on the pre-call, we were talking about this, one of my favorite TV shows that got canceled in 2008. And like, I made a video about that and it got 200,000 views. You know what I mean? And I'm like, I'm surprised there's even 200,000 people who remember what the right. show is. But like, right. because it was just clear that it came through, I think, you know, like yeah. I, I, it was like, pa I was passionate enough and I was talking about this and it was, or when the SAG strike last year was happening, the reason the show got canceled in 2008 was the 2008 Raiders strike. So it was like, timely but although not super specific to what was going on mm -hmm. but i think people just like again understood the problem right the problem of there being this strike they understand what that is um so even if they aren't familiar with the show there's still some something they can anchor on to to be interested in it you and i both have lived a lot of our lives on the internet internet culture is going from this like you know when i started in 2006 it was like incredibly niche and then recently it's been like this is internet culture is increasingly becoming culture it is not its own separate thing it is like the dominant form of culture it feels like and and you talked about brat which i know you're passionate about and and politics and i want to ask a timely question as we think about the first 36 hours of the harris campaign and we think about 
the tone that they're using, which is very like internet coded, you know, changing their header. What's your initial reaction to the first 36 hours of that campaign? So far, so good. I think what a lot of the times with marketing, like your job is not to hit the home run. Your job is to pitch a softball. Like just give them nice, most beautiful little like breadcrumb of a pitch that somebody else on the internet gets to hit the home run and feel like a hero. And I think that um, changing the header is a perfect example of that. It's very low committal. It's not, they're not posting about it a bunch. They just did it and a thousand other people posted about it, right? You know, like they they didn't make the audio of like the coconut meme or whatever with Brad. Somebody else, some mm-hmm. random teenager probably did. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, and they're just letting it ride. And that is what they have to do and should do. The the part where it starts to tip is like, I think when when they overdo it, you know what I mean? Like, because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, especially with something like politics and especially in this sort of election, like we need to see what her stance on policy is you know what i mean and something like that's really where especially if you're thinking about i mean again it's politics so like you're thinking about appealing to like a moderate you know like who's on the fence of who they're going to vote for that's how most elections are decided is on this like very small group of moderate people um what they want from her is not a coconut meme it's (laughs) going to be some sort of like clearly stated uh yeah. this is what i would do and i think we're getting again it's so early on it's it's going to be tough to get that and you know but i think within the first debate that she does and and all that and the dnc coming up and blah blah, blah like that will start to to come out so the balance you want to find again is like just pitch the ball you don't need to swing at every single thing you'll strike out like just literally yeah. pitch the ball let somebody else hit it especially when it's something that's so viral right now like there's always going to be some random 15 year old on the internet who's better at marketing than you are. Like, and that is one thing that has taught me, like there's something you can't plan that level of like cultural impact. You know what I mean? It just happens sometimes. And the second, I think you try to take control of it, people, that's when it becomes kind of like cringe and people are like, Oh, like, I don't want anything to do with this anymore. It was mm-hmm. fun when I was ours. Now that you're trying to make it yours, I don't want it anymore. Yep. Um, yep. So I think that's kind of like where this line is, but I don't, it's going to be very interesting to see. For sure. And what about for brands? I mean, I think that understanding social media and understanding marketing are two different things. And I think that some young marketers often are chasing virality and engagement and all of these things. And they look at companies that have maybe gone a little like more unhinged and less like product focused in their marketing and said, oh, look at look at how well this is doing. You know, you do have to tell a product story. Kamala Harris does have to tell us about policy. Like it is a serious job. We need a serious person who takes this seriously. Brands need to sell product. They can't always just be making jokes on the internet. And so as you like think about guiding brands and and, um, helping them navigate being relevant on the internet with like telling a product led story because they're often two different things. That's such a great point. And this is such a, battle that I have <laughs> gone gone to bat up many times for. I think there's there's two problems that the first is that there is a lot of internal pressure, like coming from somebody who is a social media manager. If you get X million amount of views in July, and then you get less than that in August, regardless of whether those videos that you made that got less views were so much better at pushing product, your boss is going to get mad at you for getting less views. Mm -hmm. That is the way where it is almost this like downfall of data sometimes that people uh, are willing to, you know, have something look better on a presentation to their boss than they are to think about long-term vision. And that it is really about balancing the both of that. And also, understand that and communicate that to your team you know it's that's when it's really on the on the leadership to be like hey like we are you know we love these videos or whatever or sometimes it's opposite sometimes you're making way too much about the product and it's like you need to connect with an audience dude like you're this is not qvc like you need to like find like build a community you know what i mean and it's about both it's really about finding both and and like doing it i guess in that way but i think the first 
big hurdle that people face is literally internal pressure. Like I, cause I remember so many times that that would happen to me and, you know, and how hard it was to communicate, especially as like so much of these social media managers, I feel like are young kids. Like it's a very first out of college type job. Right. They're worried about their job security. You know, they're maybe they're in an internship mm -hmm. and they're worried about like, cause I remember when mm -hmm. I was like that too. So that I think is a really important thing, you know, and it's honestly too a better skill. If somebody can like, actually convert a thousand unit sales i don't care how many views it gets like i do not care hire that person you know what i mean like and yeah. really understand that um so i think that's like the first thing i tell the brands is like think about um that you know like create event if there's like a venn diagram of like sales driven content and like community driven content it, it needs to be there needs to be some overlap and having just all of one you you'll lose either way i think that's like the big hurdle and then I don't know what was exactly the question like how do i convince brands of this well just just i think how do you think about like the balance and making sure you're doing both right and and like i mean it's it's interesting especially with, with a lot of our like multi-billion dollar business clients right there's just there's there's so many initiatives and things that the social and influencers need to support and then you're also trying to like make content that really like breaks through and we're often like Again, because brands need like a roadmap sometimes. We're like 75% of what you do should be scalable and repeatable, product focused. Like if you're a beauty brand, do tutorials, talk about the product, do all that. 25% should be like fun, innovative, big swings, connect with culture, have fun, make fun of yourself, like all of that, right? But like they need sometimes a little bit of a, like a, a map to know like make sure that they don't do too much one way or too much another. Because I think a part of the, the issue, and this is what I saw, like when I saw the first 36 hours of Kamala Harris, I was like, oh shit, like, I hope the team doesn't go too hard into like Duolingo. Whoa, look at how well Duolingo does. So let's like do some of that. It's like, no, oh, no, 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 no. We do, we do not want to turn the president into Duolingo. Um, and so it's like, it's an interesting balance between like, how do I do well on social? and feel like people on social media can look at me and be like, wow, that's really clever. Um, versus how do I achieve what I want? Like, cause what we want is her to get elected president, you know, right. not win an award at Cannes for like creative tweets. <laughs> okay, great. That, that really helped me out. I have kind of like two thoughts. The first, the thing that you really said and what I always, always push people for is invest in repeatable formats. You need to think of your content like an episodic tv show and if you can't think of what is season one or whatever you don't like you need to hit the drawing board it's so frustrating with me whenever i'm working with clients and they want to talk about like trends and stuff and i'm like i personally do not care because you could get a million views on this today what are you going to do tomorrow we're back we're in the same meeting right. again where you wasted congrats you wasted your time and you're probably not going to gain that many followers from it and even none of those people are going to buy the product right so like what I really push is like, how do we build a series? Like, how do you build a repeatable, even as like a creator business, right? From my standpoint, like I have a series or, or format or hook for every section of content. And I could like list them to you right now. If you want to know what the future of the fashion industry looks like, look no further than blank. You know, um, I, if I'm doing like songs, I always do music. I always talk about lyrics. Like that's what really people come to me for. Mm -hmm. If it's a creator economy, like the social strategy thing, this is how you go from zero to your first 100,000 followers, blah, blah, blah. And from my business standpoint, the second I get a, an, a client reach out or whatever, I'm like, okay, great. This is what my audience likes for me. Here's three examples of me doing this with like over 500,000 views. Um, this is your message. This is how I insert that message into this pre-existing framework that we know that they like and we know that they want. And that one, the brands just love it. They're like, great, <laughs> like, problem, like problem solved. And then for me, it's like, I don't have to feel like I'm annoying my audience. Like my audience, they know what this is. They expect it. So even it's sometimes just like, whether it's repeating a hook, sometimes it's a specific frame or format. Again, like for me, like I love to just like talk about lyrics of songs. It's like always what I'm most interested in. Anytime I hear a new song, it's like what I jump to, what my brain jumps to. And just finding those things like, and, and you know, thinking if that's, it's hard to say when like this blanket business, you know what I mean? But if it's like, maybe you have that for makeup and then this other thing for skincare and then this other thing for your fragrance, whatever, <laughs> like finding that and building that and also understanding that the value you will get once you get that is limitless. Like, don't just be like, oh, this didn't work. Like, let's, 
Let, let's give up. Let's go back to another trend. I'm like, no, 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 no. Because again, you do the trend. What are we doing next week? Like you right. spend a month on this, spend two months on this, because if you crack this code, it will carry you for a year, for two years, right? Like I have these, some of the videos you're referencing, I literally made over a year ago even. And yep. it's like, it, so that's what I have. You say. have, and you have like visual consistency, but it's interesting going through your feed. I can see that change. There was a time where you were against the white wall. You had like things behind you. And that was like 15 or 20 videos, you know, but you can see it evolve, but it's also consistent, right? It's not jumping like, I feel like you, yeah, even like you have that visual consistency, you can feel like it's a series. If I see your video pop up, I, I have a sense of what I'm gonna get. Right, or even unspoken things too. Like I mean, someone has like someone who has like a podcast and YouTube channel. Like I don't even like really necessarily do a call to action in every single short form video I make. But I think over time, you just can tell that I'm very clearly sitting in some sort of podcast setup or something. And people will seek that out on their own. You know what I mean? Like people on yeah. the internet are smarter than you think they are. So I think that is like this very big, like lean into formats, build formats, build repeatable content. Like it is so worth it. It is, and the, coming from a social media manager, that was how we scaled. Like that, when we started hitting our, the most amount of followers, I remember we're, there was a point where we were getting 50 million views a month. It was all series-based content. Like that is what we were doing. So that was like, I think the, the first thing I would say. And then the second thing with going with like trends and stuff like that is be fluid understand that things on the i think of the internet as just like waves it feels like water all the time you know sometimes it's a big wave sometimes it's a little wave and if the wave has crashed and died it's okay to let it go like it is okay and if the wave keeps ramping up ride it like ride it ride it ride it oh my god there's so much i feel like especially with like music artists or creator clients i have they're like complaining to me about content and i like look through their page for like really 10 minutes and I'm like, okay, here's this video with a million views. Here's this video, 500,000 views, this. These were great formats. You never made a part two to any of them. That is like my first yeah. piece of advice every time. I'm like, you're trying to like reinvent the wheel every single day. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your energy. Like mm -hmm. if 500,000 people were interested in something, do it again. I also think people just get caught in this idea of like, well, the second one got 300,000. So I should, who cares? <laughs> the video you were going right. to make is going to be less <laughs> than that. Like, who cares? I'm like, keep like, the rave will crash eventually, it is okay, but until it has, ride it. So that's yeah. like another thing too, you know, like if there's this brat thing might last for a month, it might end next week. Uh, and if it yeah. lasts for a month and you're like, there's this one, I made, literally made a video about this campaign because it was so good. This company, Field Roast, um, they have brought like brought as their product. So they literally mm -hmm. rented, there was like a brat billboard and they paid for the billboard next to it. And in the same front just wrote like, so it's brat, B-R-A-T, then worst. Yeah. W-U-R-S-T yeah. and a picture of the product. That was it. And it went so viral. So good. So good. So good. And that yeah. was a perfect example of like, and again, like talking about this softball, right? They're like, this is a moment in culture. This is a moment in the internet. It will be so cheap to get this one billboard in this one city where we can find this good placement right next mm -hmm. to it. And the internet will take it from there. You know, that's an example of them leaning in when they just saw this moment. But next month or two months from now, they don't need to pay for the billboard anymore. You know what I mean? Like, I think like be be okay with letting it go is is the thing too. And and also again, going back to this like management and stuff, trust your team. You know, if they're like, hey, this is working right now. I understand mm -hmm. you had that thing in our content calendar. We need to push it back. <laughs> this is working yeah. right now. It's really like, you know, you hire somebody because they are spending a lot more time on this thing than you are. You're overseeing 15 people. They're spending every single hour of their day logged into the Instagram account, right. you know, like trust that they know that I think it's like a, a good way. So I think it's like be more fluid. That's amazing advice. And you sometimes are having an interview and you're like, I know we're going to clip that um, and make sure people see that because that is really, really good. Uh, my final question for you uh, is just like, who's who's your who's your favorite follow right now? My favorite follow on like another account that I follow. Yeah, yeah. There's so many good ones. I have really recently been into this creator. Her name is Molly McPherson. I don't know if you've ever seen her videos. She is a, and I also think we're about to uh, create economy prediction. I'll incorporate that into this too. She's like her real life job and has been for years. She's like a, a, a mom in her, I think, mm -hmm. 40s, like she's older, has been, she works in PR. She's been a PR crisis manager all her life. And now she just makes videos like reviewing any sort of things in culture from mm -hmm. like this perspective of being like a PR crisis. Or she'll just like look at somebody's statement, you know what I mean? Like she would read the statement yeah. Joe Biden put out and read the statement Congress right, right. put out and just like 
talk she's like this is what i think that the team was talking about when they wrote it it because they use this rhetoric i think that they're going to try and push this thing and it's so cool because mm -hmm. it's like one she has again it's this credibility what i think of the prediction is that i think we're going to see so many creators like that like people who mm -hmm. are just have real jobs or just very real industry experience and are like hold on a minute i've been doing this for 20 years for somebody else I can make way more money doing it for myself on the internet. And it's going to be really cool to see these people who are so talented at their jobs, like be able to discover this medium to get their work recognized and discovered in ways that did not exist when they entered the workforce. It's just like so interesting because I love what she does is that it can transcend mediums. You know, it can be about yeah. something happens with a music artist, then it's politics, then it's this movie, yeah. and it's, you know, but it's like what the audience likes is her expertise and her expertise mm -hmm. can apply to this entire umbrella of things. And that's a really cool thing to think about. And also, again, I think with brands, I'll throw in another one in there, that they always, like, when they think about, like, niches and stuff, it's like, you're, you're like, an audience is not a what, it is a who. Like, it is a, mm -hmm. a group of people, you know what I mean? And on paper, somebody might label her as, like, an entertainment creator because it's PR or whatever, or they see a video of her talking about Lizzo's statement, like, when she was going through stuff right. last year. But it's like, no, she talks about a whole range of things, but it's who is people who are interested in this expert opinion or interested in this industry mm -hmm. analysis. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's Molly McPherson. Check her out. She's so good. I got, we got predictions and a follow out of it. Um, thank you so much. Uh, everyone uh, go follow Nikki and, Listen you know, my uh, and please do. And, uh, you know, I hope our, our paths cross and we get to work together sometime. Um, oh, I would really absolutely incredible love to. stuff. Good it meeting. was such a pleasure. That was so great. Thank yeah. you. And if Callie's still there, tell her to buy. <laughs>